Okay, welcome. Today's uh, webinar title is uh, What Causes a Share Price to Change or What the Market to Change? And obviously, with today's uh, uh, results of the year's election, it's quite, uh, <laughs> quite appropriate. So, um, the whole idea today is that um, how many of you have ever wondered what causes or uh, why a share price would rise and fall? So it is an emotional roller coaster, uh, especially when you've just bought a share and uh, it goes down. But uh, you know, one day we have profits, and uh, next day we have losses. And uh, obviously, for many investors, it's it's too much to bear. But, but that's what that's what makes the market is that roller coaster that what where the share price goes up and down and the market goes up and down. Um, so most of us, or most investors, would know that share prices move up and down as a result of supply and demand. So understanding the supply and demand dynamics is the easy part. Okay, and we'll talk about it about just uh, in a few seconds. You know, what's difficult to understand is what makes people buy or like a particular share and dislike or sell another share. So it all comes down to what news is positive for a company or for a market and what news is negative for a company. So there are many answers to this problem and obviously you speak to a lot of investors or a lot of uh, uh, traders, they'll have their own ideas and strategies. So in this webinar today, We'll be discussing some of those ideas and strategies to try and figure it all out. Um, but my hope today after this webinar is that you not only understand why share prices rise and fall, but also you'll just discover how to use this information to get bargains, um, especially with the volatility on the market now. Uh, there's bargains on the market and also when to take profits uh, when uh, obviously your uh, investments are more successful. You can see also there by the, the subtitles, a quote from Warren Buffett. It's based, well, it's based on a quote from Warren Buffett. And he said that, I never attempt to make money on the stock market. I buy on the assumption that they will close the market the next day and not reopen it for five years. So that is, if I had to put it into context, my main objective today. Um, you know, and there's, there's three other quotes that you can find based along the similar lines. Is only buy something that you're perfectly happy to hold if the market shuts down for 10 years. If you aren't willing to own a stock for 10 years, don't even think about owning it for 10 minutes. Okay, so obviously I'm talking from an investment point of view. And there's another quote from, from, from Warren Buffett and his, and his partner, Charlie Munger, says, when we own portions of outstanding businesses with outstanding management, our favorite holding period is forever. Now, the reason I'm saying all this is that, you know, obviously with the volatility in the market today, we've seen it today, um, there's a lot of panic in the market. Um, obviously, people are surprised of uh, Trump being elected president. You know, yesterday, the uh, the markets were up. The, the general sentiment was bullish that, the, that Hillary Clinton would be the president, and she was more pro the markets. And today, obviously, you've seen that Trump's been elected new president, and the market has taken a tank. I saw that the dollar has weakened, and obviously our rand also has fallen more than 30 cents today. Um, when I saw earlier this morning, gold shares were up 12 percent. Um, but since then, obviously the market has chewed, chewed over the the implications of, of of Trump coming in, and I'll talk about it now in a bit more detail. But um, the the markets have have recovered off their lows. I saw that uh, at the one stage the Dow futures were down more than three percent. Say 1.79% down now. So yes, they're still down, but uh, they have recovered. And the gold shares, as I said, they were up 12%. They've pulled back a bit. They're only up 6%. So uh, a lot of our markets were down at least 2.5%. They've pulled back to about 1.5% now. So bottom line, what I want to take away from this is that, um, you know, I want you to think long term. If you do your homework, do your research, and you build a great portfolio with outstanding companies and outstanding management. The rewards will be there. You will have the capital growth and you will have the dividends. Remember, I always talk about peace of mind and, and, and having a situation where I call swan, sleep well at night. So you know, people panic for the wrong reasons. And to come back to, to, to Donald Trump, and we're talking about it in our, in our traders meeting this morning. You know, I can remember when Ronald Reagan 
was uh, announced as president, they thought, wow, the end of the world is here. You know, what is it? This is a guy as an actor. What does he know about being a president? Uh, but bottom line, down you know, a few years later, we found that Ronald Reagan was one of the best presidents ever. So my my feeling and my opinion, uh, give Trump a ch give him a chance and see what happens from here. You know, but people panic. Uh, but uh, when people panic, it creates opportunities for the investors, and that's why we're having this presentation today. Okay. So here's another little quote just to lighten things up. It says one of the funny things about the stock market is that every time one buys, another sells, and both they, or both of them think they are astute or clever or wise. So um, you know that's what makes the market interesting. We have to have opposite opinions. Everybody thinks the same, but everybody buying the same time, and everybody selling the same time. So we need opposite opinions or difference of opinions. Okay. So this is a quote from William Feather. He's an American author. Um, but me personally, I'm also, uh, I'm convinced that there's a group of people in financial journalism, people that work for Business Day or Financial Mail or the guys on M MoneyWeb, even the guys on, on CNBC and Bloomberg's, what I call the talking heads. You know, I believe that these guys <laughs> make their living by making up reasons why the stock market went up and down on a given day. You know, uh, when in reality, they have no idea what caused the daily gyrations or the moves in the market. You know, aside from the obvious ones, where a company has beaten uh, uh, expectations, and we'll talk about expectations just now, or um, when a, there's a, been a huge loss where everybody else is expecting some profits or to be highly profitable, those kind of things, obviously, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, the changes in the share prices, I believe, is, is a result more of randomness than anything else. Okay, we'll talk about it in more detail just now. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me just get some water here. So, what is the current situation? If we had a look for uh, the, the uh, we already mentioned that right now, today, yes, there's panic on the market, there's volatility and things like that. But the main focus of today's presentation is um, the share price changes every day as a result of market forces. And we'll talk about in more detail what all those market forces. So the share price changes because of supply and demand. Now, when I talk about supply and demand, those of you that don't know what I mean by that, if we have more people wanting to buy a particular share than, than there are sellers, the price will rise. Okay? More buyers than sellers, price will rise. Alternatively, if there are more sellers than buyers, the price will fall. Okay, so that's the easy part to understand. You know, understanding supply and demand is easy, but what we want to do now is uh, we want to dig a bit deeper. So the principal theory is that share price movement of a share indicates what investors or the market will feel or think a company is worth. So when we talk about feel or think, that's what we call market sentiment or investor sentiment or investor confidence. Okay, so it's all based on Earnings, and we'll get into it a bit more detail just now. That's another quote from Warren Buffett. And, and, and before I get to that, you know, a lot of people equate the value of a company with the share price. Don't ever equate the value of the company with the share price. You know, a company's trading at 100 Rand, that's not the value of the company, okay? Warren Buffett says, price is what you pay, value is what you get. And I've used that on many, many uh, occasions before. You know, 500 Rand share can be cheap relative to earnings. And a 50 cent share can be expensive relative to earnings. So the value of a company is what's called the market capitalization, the size of the company, which is the share price multiplied by the number of shares in issue. So, for example, a company that trades at 100 Rand a share and has got a million shares in issue will be worth 100 million. Now, that company will be will have a lesser value than a company that's trading at 50 Rand with 50 million shares in issue. In other words, it's worth 250 million. So that's where a lot of people get confused. Don't equate the value of a company with the, the share price. But to complicate things further, the share price of a share, of the share, uh, uh, the, the price of a share doesn't only reflect the, co the company's current value, it reflects the growth that investors expect in the future. So it's that uh, future growth, I call it future growth expectations. And my objective today is for you to learn how to manage those expectations. So the most important factor that affects the value of a company is its earnings. 
Now, another word for earnings is the profit a company makes. And in the long run, no company can survive without profits. Okay, I know it's, it's, it's a silly statement to make, but just think about it. If a company never makes money, it's not going to stay in business for very long. So listed companies have to report their profits in South Africa twice a year. The first six months of their business, which is interims, and then obviously for the for the finals or the for the year end. But now market analysts at all these different stockbrokers, they have market analysts, and they'll be watching with intense attention when those results get published. Why? The reason behind this is that analysts will be, will base their future value of the company on their earnings projections, on their earnings projections, and that's what I call expectations. Okay, so. Now, on the next slide, we're going to look at where the confusion comes in. And this is where some of you might have heard of the concept before, the thing called discounting. The market anticipates future events up to two years in advance. You know, so people were taking a, a, a position in the markets ahead of the announcement of the U.S. elections, who is the next president. And if it was positive, it would be in their, fa in their favor. And negative, they would have lost money. But that's where we talk about discounting future events. So... Um, this is what we call is results expectations. There's three scenarios always. If the company's results surprise the market, in other words, it's better than expected, you can anticipate that the share price will jump or the share price will, will rise. If the company's results are as expected, in other words, there's no surprises, okay, the share price will fall. Why? Because people have bought up in anticipation of the results. That's the old saying, buy on rumor, sell on fact. Okay, so when the results come out, it's as expected, and then people will be taking their profits. The price would have risen already ahead of the results. So that's where a lot of people get confused. And the third scenario is where the, the company's results disappoint. In other words, they're worse than expected, and this is where the share price will fall. Okay, so... Discounting future events or future financial results and anticipating uh, those results. This is what we're talking about in the scenario here. So what's our deal situation for you as an investor? How can we use this information? So we'll now examine why prices will rise and fall over the short term as well as the long term. Then understand those are two scenarios, short term and long term. So we look at each one of these factors, or I call them catalysts, or the reasons behind these movements. They are very different depending on the length that the share price changes. Okay, the 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 the, the time period you're looking at. Share price variation variations over the short term are incredibly frustrating for investors, particularly when you've, as I said just now, just, you just bought a share and it drops a few rands straight away. Or just after that you've placed the order to sell it and the price drops. Okay, so that's where the frustration comes in the short term. So let's look at some of these factors. And um, before I get into that, let me just, in the, the ideal situation, as I say, what I want you to gain from this, to be in a better situation where you have a better understanding or awareness of those factors. In other words, it's going to give you more, fact, uh, more um, confidence um, so you can take advantage of the market. But also... To be in a situation where I call it creating an edge, where you know you're making a, a, a wiser and more informed decisions, you're not panicking because of emotions, um, but also you, you could be in a situation where you can wait for opportunities, where you can buy when the market, where everyone else is panicking, you be, be buying up or scooping up those bargains. Okay, so the idea is that the ideal situation for you is be able to manage. The expectations, your own expectations. Okay, coming back to what I said just now, having a peace of mind and be able to be in a situation where I call sleep well at night because my portfolio is good quality, undervalued stocks. If you're a value investor, those kind of things. Okay, so that's what we're looking at in this scenario. So how do we get there? So on the next slide, we're going to discuss some of the catalysts that causes the share price to rise in the short term. So firstly, what is a catalyst? The way I look at catalyst is an observable event or thing or trigger. That's a word I like to use, a trigger that makes people want to buy or sell a share. Now, these catalysts can influence whether or not people want to buy uh, or sell both individual shares or the market in general. Okay, so a classic example right now, obviously, the US, the US elections, Trump being the winner, there was, was a, quite a, a, a serious market sell-off, especially in Asia this morning. 
Um, but as I said yesterday, the market is up because Clinton was leading the polls. So remember, these are the catalysts we'll be talking about. So if, if people want to buy or sell shares across the board, they will have a, notice, a noticeable short-term effect. Okay? But typically will result in long-term changes in the share price of the share. Okay, so we'll get into the nitty gritties uh, in, in more detail. So there are six factors I'm looking at. Short, when I say short-term positive factors, which causes the share price to rise. So first of all, better than expected earnings or revenue. We've spoken about this already. This is when they, when uh, you find that the share price will jump up on expectations that uh, the analysts will raise their, their projections. Okay, doesn't happen very often. Uh, this is where you sometimes you'll see the share price jumps five or ten percent on the back of a, a, a financial result. Okay, so if it outperforms the analyst expectations, the share price will jump up. Excuse me, let me grab some water again. I'm getting too excited here. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, you know. It's JC rules that if the company expects its earnings to be greater than 20% compared to the previous period, they have to release what's called a trading update or trading statement. And a lot of times, obviously, this can also be a trigger for the share price to move. So it's important to watch the, the press and that. Create a watch list and then have the sense announcements linked to your watch list so you get those alerts because those, those are opportunities to trade. Okay, so that's number one. And number two, um, is when there's a new product announcement. So this is ideal, for, for, I'm using an example now, for companies like that are pro product-centric, that are focused on products. I'm using an example here, a company like Aspen Pharmaceuticals. Now, when the company new, uh, announces a new product or, or anticipated a, a new product release, that can have a big uh, impact on the company's share price. Now, I'm an Apple user. I'm a, I'm a fan of Apple. Can you remember back? Whoops, let me just go back. Can you remember when the first iPhone was a big deal for for Apple? Okay, so you know new products may bring an extra income for the company, and obviously would lead to higher profits and things like that. So that's what happened with with iPhone. But since then, all the different releases, oh, um, um, you know, the market doesn't really get excited. You know, you have to really have to wow investors. I remember when they released the the Apple Watch, you know. It didn't do much to the to the Apple share price, so you know people get accustomed to new generations of products. So they you know they're not game changers. So when a new product comes out and people anticipate, wow, this thing's going to be profitable, you can anticipate the share price to jump up. Yeah, and then obviously broker or, or analyst uh, upgrades. This is where you see that you read in the newspaper the, the, the price target for a company is, is being raised from, from, for example, 10 rand a share in earnings to 15 rand. That's where the share price jump will go through the roof. So this is when major stock brokerage, the research houses, get behind a share and they upgrade it. Now, a lot of these broker houses have fund managers and money managers. Now, if they get behind it, remember, they're sitting on a little capital, they will start including those funds those shares in their funds. And obviously that also triggers uh, uh, the share price to run. And then bad news for competitors. <laughs> now imagine a scenario where ShopRite suddenly declares bankruptcy overnight. You know, rather than, the say for example, rather than bad business conditions, a few executives, the management has been involved in some, some shady um Accounting practices. I'm just using an example here, okay? So, and they uh, secretly have extorted billions of rands over the years. Remember, I'm talking about a company. I'm not referring to anybody in government or government agencies, okay? That's a, a joke, okay? So, so, what would happen? The competing retailers like Pick and Pay would benefit from that. Why? Because they would benefit from the, the, the imaginary misfortune. So, although the the benefit, the share price might, for, for pick and pay, their share price might go up slightly. ShopRite share price can fall as much as 50%, for example. But pick and pay share price might not do so well, uh, not, uh, not follow suit. So that's one side of the coin. Other side of the coin, obviously, the bad news for the competitors would only benefit the, the, the share if the bad news for the competitor is unrelated to changing business conditions. Just understand that scenario too.
And then we have a scenario we have a bid for acquisition, and the company that comes to mind is is, is Steinoff. Uh, Steinoff was at one stage bidding for all these companies in the UK, and they obviously did not get the businesses and things like that. But usually when we talk about a, a acquisition, this is where a small company gets a buyout offer, and obviously you as a small private investor or, or as a small shareholder will be offered the same deal. And it's usually at a premium, and that's why the share price will jump up. There's no other factor that will cause the share price to jump more than a suitor looking to buy a company. So you'll find a lot of times there'll be uh, announcements uh, and that they have to go through the stock exchange news service, the sense announcements, because it's price sensitive and that could, change, it could cause the share price to move. I found this in the past where good companies, the, the, fundamentally the company is great, but the share price has been battered down. Um, these are the companies that usually are bought out um, you know, they're underloved and they usually find it as a, as a management buyout. Um, and those are opportunities where you, know, you as, a, as a shareholder can also be compensated at a premium. And the last positive uh, short term uh, catalyst, I think, is a new positive uh, regulation or law. Again, I'm going to use Aspen. You know, when we spoke, when they first came on board, the antiretroviral, the HIV drugs. Remember, Aspen's main business is, is generics. So any new law that will improve the bottom line for Aspen would have benefited them. <coughs> Excuse me. You can take one step further, a hypothetical example. Let's look at our retailers again. Okay, I'm using ShopRite uh, example. But let's say, for example, the government or SARS decided to pass a a new law that uh, increases VAT for online shopping. So a lot of people will switch from online shopping, especially with big ticket items, and rather go buy uh, cheaper options in, 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 in a store. I'm using an example like that. Yeah. So those are kind of uh, rules and regulations that can be positive for a company. Yeah. So let's move on to the short-term negative catalysts. So first of all, the opposite would be worse than expected revenues. So this is what I call an earnings miss, uh, especially when they double digit losses more than inflation. Um, obviously, it's uh, earnings miss comes to on the back of a earnings mess. So they can obviously be negative for a company share price. So it's just the opposite of the positives just now. Um, losing a product patent, go back to our scenario with Aspen, you know, generic drugs, the, the license only lasts for, for a few years. Thereafter, obviously, they can be made by the competitors. So that's, um, can, can, <laughs> if that, that, call it a, uh, a big brand name, it can generate billions for a company, suddenly it gets taken away. Um, that can affect the company share price also big time. And then um, we spoke about it just now, broker upgrades is the opposite, broker downgrades. This is when a major uh, research house broker downgrades a stock. Obviously, it loses institutional support and the fund managers will sell out of the stock. Another scenario you can also look at is every quarter, for example, the futures close out, the JSC will look at the constituents of the top 40 and the mid-cap stocks, so the top 100 shares. So some stocks are moving to the top 40 and some stocks will move out. And obviously, a lot of fund managers that are track the, the top 40 index will sell those stocks that are moving out of the top 40 index. That's another example of where the share price in the short term can be negative and, and fall. Okay. And we talk about good news for competitors. This is a scenario where um, – uh, my background says I used to be in the restaurant business. So, you know, something good happens within the company's competitors. Uh, you know, we look at the restaurant industry. We talk about taste holdings and, and famous brands. You know, taste holdings might be um, with, with, its, with its Domino's pizzas and things like that, might be losing market share to Debonair's pitch. I'm using an example there. So that's uh, uh, it's, they bring a new, a new product on board. And everybody's flocking to that that uh, pizza chain. Um, it, it'll, it'll feed through to the share price eventually. You can also look at um, in the construction sector. You know, two construction companies bidding for the same <coughs> con uh, same contract. I'm using an example again: the Soccer World Cup. Whoever wins the the, the contract, obviously, share price will go up. Okay. And then we have failed acquisitions, and again, this is where uh, I think of Steinoff. Um, you know, the buyout never happens, and obviously the share price runs up before that. 
And uh, obviously, you know, the, the whole idea about acquisitions, and the reason why I would say this is setting up an acquisition is expensive. There's a lot of people you have to pay, but also you need to get approval. You know, the competition tribunal, competition board, all those kind of things. I remember also very recently, um, the SAB, Miller, and ABM Bev deal was in jeopardy with the whole Brexit thing. Can you remember that the, and, the, and, and, the, and the sentiment around that? So um, that also can be a, in the short term a negative for, for a company share price. And then management changes. You know, when the CEO or the chief financial officer, especially when they re, when they um, when there's a sudden departure overnight, uh, there's something bad happening that you'll find the share price gets gets hit big time. Um, but usually a company would, if it fires its uh, CEO because of poor performance, it's usually done behind closed doors and it's done gracefully, but not suddenly. Yeah. If you suddenly fire your CEO and you're looking for a new CEO, you're going to find that you're going to battle finding a new CEO because you don't want to work for a company you just ran out the last year without any warning. Okay. But the bottom line is the sudden management changes. That's a red flag you must be aware of. And then lawsuits. Um, and that's never good for any company. We've seen it with MTN in Nigeria. We've seen it with the construction companies going back to the Soccer World Cup around the collusion and all that. I remember a few years ago with Tiger Brands, with the whole bread, the bread price fixing. I remember with Sassel, they paid a fine. Uh, I think it was the Polyfin division. So those kind of lawsuits. Um, but also other examples would be patent rights and, and product licensing and things like that. Yeah. And then last one, obviously, new negative uh, uh, regulations and things like that. So anything that's, that restricts the company from making money uh, would be obviously bad for the share price, ultimately, or bad for the profits and bad for the share price ultimately. So those are short-term and negative catalysts. I also believe there are other situations that cause the share price to, to, to rise and fall. Now, there's no visible catalysts in these examples. I call them for technical reasons. So number one is the action by the big players. You know, the big fund managers, the big um, uh, institutional players that, that controls a lot of money that can influence the, 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 the prices, remember supply and demand. So this is from a technical analysis point of view. This is why I like to use technical analysis that look at volume. Uh, volume always leads price. Uh, you want to pick up insider trading, I always look at volume. We talk about an indicator called volume price uh, trend. It highlights volume accumulation and volume distribution. So I'm using example again, old uh, Christo Visa. Um, he's involved, he's the chairman of both ShopRite and Steinhoff. Um, and there's talks of a, this big merger happening. So uh, the, the, these are big players shuffling around the shoulders and things like that can affect the share price. It can also be the same reason for selling. You know, if the share is down 2% on the day, but the market's still up, you know, you know, there's nothing unusual. So those are the kind of things you look at. But volume is a key in the play indicator when we're looking at action of big players. Okay. Then we talk about pullbacks. Now, this is common when the share price is gain 20%, especially after the release of good results. And then we talk about Profit taking. Okay, we talk about profit taking. The share price pulls back five or ten percent on profit taking uh, before advancing higher again. Okay, so that's another scenario. And then we have what you call market corrections. This is where the whole market uh, pulls back. There's nothing wrong with the share, just that the market might, the, 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 all the investors as a whole think of the market is overpriced. It's expensive. And we were talking about the pre year ratios and things like that. So that's what we call about the market correction. And then the fourth scenario is what we call a consolidation period. This is where the share price rises very fast on the back of, of good earnings again, but then it moves sideways. Okay, this is where the markets or the investors are taking a breather, digesting the information, like we're seeing now with Trump and the market, what are the impact and mulling it over. So that's that sideways market where the market taking a pause. We're waiting for new information. If it's positive, we carry on. If it's negative, we break down. Okay. There's a saying in the market, the share would grow into its new earnings growth expectation. So those are the four scenarios. I call it technical reasons why the share price will rise and fall also. Okay, so it's not a real catalyst, but you can look at it as, as a um, 
as a technical correction. Then we look at some, I call them economic factors, and this is more the long-term impact. So long-term long factors that cause the share price to rise and fall. Um, so we know why the share price moves on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, in the long term, there are a lot less reasons, uh, but these reasons a lot of people don't really understand. Now, by learning and applying this information, you can gain an edge, as I spoke about right in the beginning, in predicting how the markets will fare over the next few years. So my objective, and I'm a fundamentalist and a technical analyst, my goal always is to identify the primary trend. Are we in a primary bull market or a primary bear market? And I act according to that. But there are six economic factors uh, that you can also anticipate that uh, will have a big impact on the market over the long term. So number one, obviously, interest rates. The South African Reserve Bank can raise or lower interest rates to stabilize, to stabilize or to stimulate the economy. This is what we call monetary policy. So now as a company, we can borrow the money to expand and improve our business. But obviously, when the price interest rates start going up, our cost of debt also increases. So the impact of that is that's going to impact our profits, our dividends, and can cause the share price to drop. That's number one. Number two is that obviously, as, you, as interest rates go up, you'll find that um, investments that pay interest, what I call the interest-bearing securities, the bond market and things like that, you'll find there's a switch People move from, from the from the share market into interest-bearing securities. That's another factor with ri rising interest rates. So think of interest rates like a seesaw. Interest rates go up, market comes down. Interest rates come down, market goes up. Okay. So on the back of that, obviously economic outlook. If things are looking up, things are positive. Um, we're talking about expanding. We anticipate future profits. You find that share prices are rising. We anticipate a contraction. Obviously, people will start re reducing their buying and start selling and things like that. You know, you can talk, on the back of that also, we can talk about the, the ratings downgrade because of the economic outlook. So to a large extent, I believe it's been discounted. We have spoken about it in previous webinars. Um, so, yeah, that's another thing. Inflation, um, we talk about um, higher consumer prices, which, which obviously... Uh, lead to slower, slower uh, sales and obviously uh, reduce the profits and things like that. Um, and obviously, as, interest, as inflation goes up, remember the Reserve Bank will use interest rates as a mechanism to calm things down. But saying that, also things like commodities, especially the gold price, will do, gold will do better. People moving to safe haven when inflation goes up. Economic and political shocks, okay? Um, you know, we, I mentioned before, U.S. elections this morning. Uh, we experienced Nanny Gate in December. We saw this outflows. We saw rand weakness. Um, we saw most recently, obviously, the whole thing around uh, our finance minister, Provin Gordon, all those kind of things. We can go one step further. Rising energy costs, obviously, high inflation, high interest rates, terrorist attacks, shooting sprees in America, all these kind of things can affect the market. Changes in economic policy. Again, come back to the U.S. elections. The Democrats were seen as pro-markets and Republicans were not. Um, and that's why everybody has moved into gold and that kind of stuff. And then the value of the RAND. If you're an exporter and the RAND weakens, obviously, uh, it's cheaper for our, our consumers of, uh, overseas to buy our uh, other products, which leads to more, pro uh, more uh, profits and things like that. When the rent strengthens, it becomes more expensive and obviously will impact you as an exporter. Okay, so those are the six factors that can impact you. So what are the benefits of all this? And my goal yet today is just to say to you that, you know, imagine if you had a magic wand. What's our deal situation to be in? I look at it this way. I want to have a, a watch list of potential winners. So out of that watch list, I want to be buying shares for my portfolio. So it's a big time saver. And there's two scenarios. I scan shares that are fundamentally or uh, uh, fundamental criteria, and I scan shares on the technicals. So I'll scan shares based on that are undervalued, profitable, with manageable risk. And there's various criteria you can use: P/E ratio below 10, a, a peg ratio. Uh, price NAV, when we look at profitability, uh, return on equity greater than 15%, and a manageable risk, I can look at cash flow relative to earnings or interest cover. 
Uh, when I'm looking at technicals, I want to look at the share that's in the bullish trend. I look at moving averages. A 50-day must be above its 200-day moving averages. I look at support resist and resistance trend lines. Uh, so the long-term trend is up, great, but I'm looking for pullbacks. I want to buy in weakness. I'm looking for shares that are oversold. And there's various technical indicators you can use, RSI, Stochastic, uh, MACD, etc. But I'm also in the same sense looking for shares that are outperforming. So relative to the, the whole market, relative to the sector, relative to my peers, those are the kind of scenarios I'm looking at. So the goal here is to scan for fundamental and technical criteria, take some motions out of it so I can create that watch list and helps me bend the odds in my favor and helps me create that edge I was talking about just now. So here's an example of, I did a scan a few days ago, undervalued profitable and manageable risk. There's all these shares that are green based on the peg ratio. You can see the profitability there, okay? And also manageable manageable risk. So a P ratio, peg ratio, interest cover, those kind of things. So it helps you to big time save it focus on the shares that are might be offering offering, uh, offering a opportunity and then you from there you go click on the shared code and do further analysis what i like to do is take that list and put it into excel spreadsheet or i create a watch list in my went software and from there i scan and look for the shares now one of those shares in that list there for example is com air okay um which is our well um uh come blank now Co uh, uh, kalula Okay, so this is what happened with, what happened with share price a few days ago. We're hitting a new high. It is bullish trend. I like to buy it on weakness. It is coming to oversold territory, so I anticipate it might pull back to test my 50-day moving average. So I know the shares undervalued, and I know it's profitable than that, but I want to get in a bit of timing. So that's combining fundamentals and technicals, what I call rational analysis. You see the volume price trend. The price might fall. But the institutions, the big guys are still holding it to the stock. It is also outperforming. But I'm trying to, trying to get your point across that combine the two strategies together, what I call rational analysis. Okay. So let me anticipate some of your questions. And uh, just I know I'm running out of time here, guys. From value investing or any other type of investing for that matter, it varies in execution with each person. So but there are certain general principles or guidelines that are shared by all investors. And one of them is, number one, is buy the business, not the share. So this is one thing that all value investors agree on. Buy the business, not the share. So ignore the, the trends in the market, the panic selling and things like that, and all the other market noise. Look at the fundamentals of the company that you're interested in. That's number one. Number two, you know, love the business you want to buy. You want to pick your spouse based solely by looking at his or her shoes. Now, you shouldn't pick a share also just based his, uh, hastily on the, uh, 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 on a brief research. You have to dig a bit more, uh, dig a bit deeper. Now, I remember when I first got involved in the share market, you know, I, I became very passionate about knowing everything about the company. And I remember my very first share I ever bought was Spur Corp. Okay, and I got to know everything about Spur. This is way before the days of Panerotti's and, and uh, John Dory's and things like that. Spur Corp was where I was involved in. I specialized in the beverage and hotel sector, and that's how I expanded out. So love the business you want to buy. Secondly, what I find very important, simple is best. If you don't understand what the company does or how it makes its money, stay away from it. You know, there's that old saying in the market, you know, you want to make it educated guess about the future earnings of a company. The more, complex, more complex a business is, more uncertain your, your, your projections are going to be. And that's where we move from emphasizing education to becoming, a, or if, from, if, from moving from educated to just making a guess. Okay. Number four, look for the owners, not the, uh, not the managers. You know, management can make a big difference in the company. They can add a lot of value to the company, to its assets, but also saying that bad management can destroy the most solid financial company. Okay, so Warren Buffett says, look for three qualities in management, integrity, intelligence, and energy. So you, if, if they don't have the first, which is integrity, the other two will kill you. So it's important when you're looking at, I call it the glossies, the financials of the company. You need to look at a few, several years worth of financials. Look at the quality of the management. And then also, you know, when you find a good share, buy a lot. You know, this is where, you know, as a value investor, you know, you have to sit on the thing and um, 
sometimes you have to ride out for a long time. Okay. Um, so I'm going to skip over there quickly. We don't have time, as I say. A measure against the best investment. A lot of times you'll find that you'll have additional cash in your portfolio, additional investment capital. So the idea is that you don't want to diversify too much. I've spoken about this before, between 8 and 12 shares and between 3 and 5 different sectors. So you're either going to find an investment that's better than the shares in your portfolio that will give you a reason for selling, and I'd rather sell the ones that are underperforming. Alternatively, um, I'll be buying more of the shares I have in my portfolio already. And the third scenario, I'd rather wait for better times. You know, and that's why it's important to have a watch list of potential winners. So identify it based on certain fundamental criteria. So when the opportunity arrives, like today, when the market does pull back, the shares become more uh, undervalued. That makes easy, makes decisions for buying those shares easier. And then ignore the market 99% of the time. It comes back to, again, having that long-term view. You know, there's only two reasons why you want to buy the share. Uh, there's only two times where, where um, it matters to be in the market. Obviously, it's when you want to buy and when you want to sell. The rest of the time, I think about approaching uh, buying shares like buying a business. You hold on, hold on to the company as long as the fundamentals are strong. Okay, so it's... It, Remember also, if you want to sell the share, you get a ticket capital gains, number one, and secondly, obviously, transaction costs. So be aware of those kind of scenarios. So bottom line, you know, value investing is a strange mix of common sense on the one hand and a very contrarian thinking. When we else is selling, you want to be buying. And when we else is buying, you want to be selling. So it's important to do your homework. And I spoke about this in last week's webinar. A lot of people are trying to time the market instead of spending time in the market. And that's why, you know, you can focus on unit trust like the PSG funds. There are a lot of PSG value funds. I believe are opportunities right now. Um, so that's timing, the, you know, time in the market, which is important. Okay, guys. So let me just quickly see what kind of questions you guys have. Uh, I'm sorry I've gone over board at eight. I've got to, I, I added too much extra information. Okay. Colin. Nice comment, a nice seminar to remind one of all the various reasons. Cool. Thanks, pleasure. Pleasure, Colin. Uh, uh, Graham, I'll be sending the presentation to everybody. Uh, yeah, creating watch lists. Uh, and, I, and by the way, you'll see on my next slide when it comes to the, the conclusion, I suggest that you guys go, go through the online tutorials, especially on the fundamentals that highlights how to uh, to what 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 uh, stuff to look at? Milan Robert Kiyosaki talks about having investing in small caps. Uh, is this still a valid strategy? Um, do you need to do it even more research? I was a leader, a leap of faith. Okay, small caps, great question. Um, obviously, these stocks are under the radar screen of the institutions, so they're not so well researched. So be aware of that, number one. Number two, you'll find that a lot of these companies are more domestically orientated, not affected by uh, international things like uh, the RAND and things like that. You'll find that they might be in a niche market. So, yes, to answer your question, you still do your homework, especially for the small companies. Uh, interest cover, I believe the interest cover there must be at least five times. You want to see the interest bill covered at least five times out of earnings. That's number one. Cash, uh, risk management is very important. Number two, cash flow is very important. Okay. So, yeah, those are the two things I would look at. But I love small caps. They're great. There are a lot of opportunities in that market. Uh, I was looking at this morning. Technically, they're also oversold. So, they're at the bottom of the cycle. Um, so, I believe there's opportunities there. Question here from Johan Kotzer. Do share prices have a cycle that relates to the, to the expected time that dividends might be paid? Um, yeah, you'll find that, again, in anticipation of, of earnings, people start buying, if especially if they anticipate the results are going to be good, they'll be buying ahead. Um, when the results get published, uh, it's better than expected, share price goes up. But also saying that when they announce, in their announcement, they'll have um, the date of declaration for the dividends. It's usually a, win, a, a Monday. The following uh, Monday will be ex-div, um, and you find the, the Monday after that will be uh, a dividend payout, but you find that the, the, you, you have to be owning those shares on those dates to be getting the dividends. So your share price will run up in anticipation of that. Or if the company's done very well, also this is another scenario. If the company's done very well 
and made additional profits, but the company management doesn't know what to do with these extra profits. They might might pay out a special dividend. So that's another reason why share price might run. Okay, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Uh, well, it looks like all the questions. Cool. Awesome, guys. As I said, I'm oh, sorry, I'm going to have a bit of time today. Just to quickly uh, uh, sum it up. Yeah, it's supply and demand might be the, the big factor that determines the share price. Remember, it's market capitalization is the value of the company, but it's earnings that affects the investor's evaluation. So, yes, we can look at things like P ratios and price uh, peg ratios help us determine if the share is undervalued. I, at this point in time, I believe that most of the market is fairly valued. There are pockets where we see overvaluation. There's also pockets where we see there's undervaluation. But bottom line, it's the investor sentiment and attitude and expectations that will drive the share price. So there's no one theory that can explain everything. Okay. So you need to create your own, um, call it um, a strategy. You need to develop and fine tune your own, call it edge. And that's what my edge is to do fundamentals and tacticals together, create a watch list of potential winners and then dig a bit deeper. And that's from there I started looking for the gold nuggets. So guys, I hope that's benefited for you guys. So what are the next steps? I suggest you guys go go look at the fundamentals. This takes you a link through to the macro fundamentals. And you can see how all these things fit together. Uh, those of you that don't have an equity account with us yet and take advantage of our research platform, go click on this here to help you with that process. I mentioned, forgot to mention right in the beginning that um, the PDF and the recording will be sent out either today or tomorrow. I think it'll be later this afternoon. But uh, please um, uh, be, be, out, be, be on the lookout for that uh, email. There's a feedback form. I appreciate it. And um, But I'll be contacting most of you people anyway. I need some feedback. What do you guys like about it? What you like? What do you like about the webinars going forward and things like that? Talking about ne uh, webinars, next week we're talking about how to supplement your retirement. The week after that, we talk about tax-free investment plan, um, market volatility. This is when I'm in, in, in Las Vegas. A colleague of mine, Gron Makey, will be talking about sing single stock futures and CFDs. And the week after that, another colleague of mine, Tian Hadenrich, We'll be talking about a technical analysis of the factors around that. And then I'll be back for the last webinar on the 14th of December. But guys, from my side, thank you very, very much for being on this webinar. Until next week, all the best. Bye for now.